So before we formally start, I was looking at uh, you know what's left and what's coming up. Depending how today goes, I haven't like at all prepared for it, but we might look at this custom expectations article if we've got a lot of time because that's all that's left. <laughs> um, and then talk about what to do next. Uh, we, I don't know, I, I am leaning towards maybe reposting and re like bidding on times so we can maybe get more people. Although like if the three of us agree on something, three is a great size for a book club. So um, I guess, you know, let's actually talk about that because let's not uh, miss that step. We might finish today. If so, like the one that looked, I was just um, looking at the ones that uh, Arthur and I voted on in the, the little mini poll. Uh, Shiny Test 2 has a ton of articles. And so that has some interesting stuff to go through. I looked at the cover repo and yeah, there are 20 functions, but they're all like um, implicitly called. They're not things for the most part that I've ever, like, I don't know that I ever would deal with most of them. So I'm leaning away from this as maybe not super useful to dive deep into. Um, and then uh, with our, we're going to talk about it a little bit today, but it, it again, it, it might be useful, but it's one where it's like, um, once you get it, you get it. I don't know if it's really that useful going through everything. So those are my current thoughts on what to do. And let me see if there's anything. Yeah. So if, if you have any, um, like, so I think with our probably could be useful for the same reason everything has been useful of, oh, I'm sure it's all the same. And then you actually read through and go, wait, what? I didn't know you could do that. So th that would be useful, but cover didn't really seem to have a whole lot that's worth going into. Shiny test, like I said, it has like as many or almost as many articles as functions. And so it's like, oh, that is implying that it goes deep into like how to use it, not just what's here. Um, so I thought that could be cool. And the other thing that I'm getting a hint at in this is, yes, it's all about like how to test Shiny, but because of that, it kind of talks about how to test um, just in general. And so, uh, you know, spoiler alert, this is the one I'm really leaning towards <laughs> because it seems to have the most useful info. Um, even like, but it's very specific. Like if you're not writing um, packages that use Shiny, probably not. I mean, it also is good for just testing Shiny apps, but um, it's a very, it's a more specific use case. So with all of that, do either of you have any thoughts about that? I saw some nodding from you, Arthur. So is that a, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> um, I guess a little bit. Yeah, it sounds good. I, I mean, honestly, I, 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 all of these options sound good to me. Um, for my <laughs> own part, I'm kind of dabbling in in, in shiny. Um, probably could. I, I'm working on a project now where I think testing, you know, using shiny tests would be profitable. So it, it it's maybe kind of timely for me. But I recognize that not everybody mm -hmm. is doing that. Um, so yeah, and any, pretty much anything's good, good on my side. <laughs> um, I mean, as for rebidding the time, um, I guess I'm open to that, but this, this slot works pretty well on a fairly uncrowded day. So it's, it's a nice, nice way, at least for me to end the week. But at, at the same time, I understand that, uh, you know, three can become two and, uh, right. two can become one and, uh, and, and that can become problematic. Yeah. Like as long as we have two and ideally three. Um, like three to three to five, I think is perfect. But as long as two of us are there, it's worth meeting. It's the fact that it's too easy for it to fall apart. Um, that makes me a little hesitant. Uh, I don't know if you have any ability to speak about that, Rebecca. I haven't heard if you have um, yeah, a microphone sorry. today. Um, okay. <laughs> I, my Zoom was uh, my internet's fine, but my Zoom was like having a rough go. So I'm sorry to be a little mm -hmm. late. Um, no problem. Yeah, so I heard with R, but that's where my audio connected at. So. Oh, okay. But the 
Safari. No, no problem. Just the general idea being that we might finish test that today and if not definitely next week and just starting to okay. think about what, what do we do next? Do we keep this time slot with pretty much just the you know two or three of us per week? Do we try to just rebid on times, but that'll be like that'll necessarily implement or you know lead to some dead time in between things? Or do we just choose something and go on? And I'm leaning towards Shiny Test 2 because even if you aren't working in Shiny, it seems like the articles are going pretty deep into like um, why and how to test things. Like it's specific to Shiny, but Shiny apps hit kind of every form of testing because you have to make UI tests and that's why it has its own, that's why it's, it has two of its own packages because they tried Shiny test one, like, oh, that wasn't, that didn't quite hit what we need. They made a second package to make it better. Um, so I don't know, that's, that's where I am right now. We can decide for sure in the Slack, but I wanted to get all that info out. All right. All right, so with that, I'm going to see about um, or see if we make it through today. Uh, I didn't prepare a lot, but there's, I have used these, so hopefully this will be um, useful. And I've recently like been really diving in and trying to understand how to use these. And actually, I had the experience of um, actually reading the docs for a book club versus I skimmed it to try to make something work. And I realized today why the thing I thought, like it didn't work the way I thought it was gonna work because I had kind of skipped some things in the doc. So actually reading through the whole thing in the uh, for the book club was good. Um, all right, so what we're talking today, uh, what we're talking about is test fixtures, um, which she points out later in the article, that's in, like a term of art from software development. Um, but it's the idea of uh, like things that you create in order to test things. Um, so like helper functions, um, changing the state of the um, like of the test environment in order to test things, that sort of thing. Um, and she has this quote from um, Chief CL about uh, you know, take take nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints. The idea is if you change the state for a test, you want to make sure you change it back. So all of this is about uh, making sure that anything you do during testing uh, gets restored. She goes into um, mostly like relatively simple use cases in this. Uh, the one that I've had is we have the series of packages for interacting with Slack. And we have tests that run um, without actually hitting the API most of the time, but occasionally we want to actually hit the API and make sure that things are working the way we expect. And in order to do that, we're like creating messages and you want, or, or, or like reading messages and making sure that it's all the stuff that you want. We're doing it on a free Slack. And so like the messages, messages expire. And so we've got this whole system that we're working out to make sure that the messages we think should be there are there and only those messages. And so it's test fixtures is all, you know, deal with that kind of thing. Um, the, so yeah, the, some of the specific ones she goes into is like creating a file or directory, but she even has the example of, and use this, they have a system for creating like a fake package just for the context of the test. And that means a directory and a our studio project and all these things that kind of go with that to make sure that you're thinking in that context um so yeah uh she she goes through kind of like here's the bad way to do it here's a better way here's a better way um so so she'll do this thing where she okay she changes the digits and prints the thing um and the the reason this is bad is now this option, global option has been changed. And so, uh, you know, it's not what you had it set to before you ran the test and it might break other things that, you know, other software will not work the way you expect it to. Um, and so that takes us up to the base R function on exit, which is super useful to know about that you can have functions that um, 
when the current, normally it would be when the current function finishes, the on exit gets called. Uh, but really it's when the current environment is destroyed. So that's an advanced R topic that gets really complicated, but um, the idea being that, okay, we can, we can make sure that we set it back when this environment goes away. But the problem is, um, you know, sometimes you, you know, you want it to be true for the test and then to go away after the test is done. And so, um, that is the, the next level is using this with our defer. So let's go down to here, um, where it's going to say again, after this environment goes away, it will, um, stop. But in this case, you can set the environment and, and actually by default, the environment is the environment from which the function was called. In other words, the test most of the time. Um, so just to pause there, that makes sense. Anyone, any thoughts, questions about that? Because um, that, that's a really uh, complicated subject all in itself, the idea of environments. Um, one silly question, John, because I've, yeah. I've not used this in a long time, but um, with with uh, with our, is that used in, can that be used at the level of the test files or does it need to be set mm -hmm. at the level of, let's say the, um, kind of like the entry point and, and into the into testing? Um, or, or does it work in both contexts? I, I think it, I used the second context, but not the first, if I remember correctly. It work, also works at the level of the file. And then they, you know, at the end, we ha there's some notes about how to make it work at the level of like the entire test suite. Without any work, the file, each file of the test has its own environment so that when it finishes being tested, that environment is destroyed. So you can just kind of do that freely. Um, the one of the th the caveats that you run into, and I think she has this in the other challenges, is um, if you are doing things interactively, the file doesn't have like if you just are running the file, then the file doesn't have an environment. It's just at the top level environment. But the way the um, with our the local things and with our works is if you run it at the top level environment, just when you restart R, it'll like undo anything that you've done. So that includes like, if you create files, it'll de destroy those files when R is being restarted because that's when the global environment gets destroyed. Um, that kind of thing though is what, uh, the, the difference between when you're running it kind of interactively versus when you're testing is where I had run into some problems before because when I'm working on things, I want to be able to just run it. Um, and so having like a separate setup file, they've moved away from that because it can be a pain in the ass to have this separate file that you have to make sure it gets executed, but then also gets like cleaned up when you're done. Um, so yeah, there's with our, with our, with our, with our um, I think from the, actually just to aside, I think from the logo that's supposed to be like wither, because it's a tree withering. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna try to say it that way. So wither, uh, defer, and, and also it makes sense because it goes away, so it withers. Um, anyway, so wither defer is kind of the, the core idea of um, technically it has an argument that is what environment do you want to attach this to? Um, and so it is setting up all these things that will go away. But uh, local, all the local underscore functions from uh, Wither and uh, use this and test that both have their own local uh, helper functions that are based on uh, Wither. But all the local functions, those are great. They, those are like the workhorses that you can just use those. Um, you know, she's showing an example of creating this local digits that you give it a number of sig, sig figs. And then when you call it, it will clean up. Um, it doesn't work the way it showed there actually, because you need to have this environment that is being passed on to uh, with her defer. Um, and that parent frame, that's like the secret sauce, because that means wherever this thing was called from 
is the environment that we are attaching this uh, cleanup to. So when, you know, if you call local digits from the file, it'll be when the files environment goes away. If you call it from an individual test, it'll be when the individual test finishes. Um, so yeah, that's all the, the basics. Uh, she points out some of these uh, with her built-in functions, local file, local options, local NVAR, local dir. For those though, the one that I like wanted to make sure to point out is oops, down here, local temp file. Like if you've ever um, worked with temp files in actually in any environment, especially in testing, you know, the whole process is like you um, use temp file to get the name that the file will have. And then you do something, you know, write something to it or whatever. And then at the end you delete it. Local temp file does all of those steps. Like it, you can save things to this local temp file with the one call. And then when the test ends, that file gets deleted. So it's just that one to me is a no brainer. Like it is, it does all the steps that you do if you're working with temp files and it'll just do it. And like, likewise, local temp dir um, will deal with all the cleanup and everything. Um, but local file also does that. You just are telling it exactly where to save the file. It's just that a lot of times I don't care. And the nice thing about using temp files is there's some built in cleanup if something breaks, it'll like that directory, usually your system <laughs> will deal with cleaning it up. Or if not, at least it's in that temp directory that you can safely get rid of sometime later. Um, so yeah, but there's also local file, local options is another one I've used a zillion, you know, use all the time that it's, uh, if you have something that's controlled by an option in your functions, you can just set that option with local options. And then when it's done, it'll set it back to whatever value it had before you started. Um, local end var, same idea. If you have some environment variable that you want to change, it'll uh, deal with cleaning it up afterwards. Uh, so yeah, that's the basics there. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, to specifically point out in here. When she has the case study from use this, like I said, they have local create package. Um, so this one uh, does a whole bunch of things. Uh, the Oh, the useful thing in here to see was that if you have um, calls to defer within your uh, helper function, they get resolved in reverse order. And so you know, at the end, we switched to the new use this project, set that as the, the project that's the host, and then you'll undo that. And then you'll, then you'll undo the working directory, and then you'll undo the creation. You can't undo the creation before you unset it as the project, all that kind of thing. So it mostly, I think it ends up being something you don't really have to think about, but it's nice that they did think about that. It'll undo it in the opposite order so that you don't um, like you, it, it won't cause it to fail to delete because the file's in use, things like that, because it makes sure that the file's no longer in use before it tries to delete it. Um, and then, yeah, the idea is if you call this from within a test, it creates the, the package, you run all your tests, and then it destroys the package. And so it, it's like doing all of these things. Or if you, you want to do it at the full file level, it'll create the package, run all of the tests and then destroy the package. Uh, I definitely, like, I used to be a big, oh, but you should only do it once at the beginning and then clean up at the end uh, kind of advocate. And uh, Jenny or whoever last cleaned this up talks about, yeah, but like, then it's not standalone. Yes, it's faster, but it's not almost never worthwhile to make it that much faster. You want the test to just do its thing, finish, and then destroy it, even if you end up creating a thousand packages in the course of your tests. Um, now, I say even if. If you actually created a thousand packages, that would probably be really slow, and you would get really annoyed running your tests, so there is that balance. Um, but for the most part, create and destroy within the context of the test or within the context of a file is the way to go. Um, so yeah, this is the, if you move it, it's fine. Um, and then you can have setup.r in your test that 
And this, the special part of that is instead of just letting uh, defer use the parent environment, you want to pass it this like imaginary teardown environment. Um, what this function should do is um, if you run it within setup, it'll, and then you run your tests like using test that, it'll run the setup. And then when the tests finish, it will then destroy the teardown environment um, and, and trigger the with our or with our call. This was where I ran into confusion because this can be a this is a pain interactively. Um, uh, load all with package down will run the setup and then will destroy when you're done. But if you try to just run the file, it'll be like, "What the hell's teardown environment? I don't know what to do with this," um, because it's it only exists in the, in the context of like running tests or using load all, which knows what to do with it. Um, so uh, that's, do you, that's, have, do you happen yeah. to know? Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, do, do you happen to know if, um, like, let's imagine you have an error in your 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 test, right? So mm -hmm. execution stops. Does does Wither still pass control back uh, so that the teardown is executed, or are you kind of left with a like an environmental mm -hmm. <laughs> problem? You know that, that you need that, to clean up manually. Mostly. Um, it will deal with it. There can be like if you crash R, then it, pro it, it most likely won't clean it up. But otherwise, that is part of the beauty. That's like why whether it, um, well and on exit why they exist is it's not you know the other way to do all of these is just after everything runs you manually delete the thing or re unset it or whatever. But if you do that, you never get to that line if you hit an error versus on exit and um, with our or with her both when you hit that error you are exiting that environment and therefore it undoes whatever you were doing um but yeah that is that i mean that's that's kind of the path for learning how to do these things is i had uh, a lot of database stuff that i was working with that i would hit an error and therefore the database connection never got closed and so i would get all these errors about the database connection being open it's like, oh, okay, then I'll use on exit to close them when I'm done, which is you know much better. But really, you want to go that next step of uh, whether to clean up in whatever context, like whether it's within the test or within the file or within the entire suite of tests. Um, but yeah, it'll almost always <laughs> execute. The only I think uh, an R crash is the only time when it'll fail. And even then, I think depends how it recovers. So sometimes it might um, get that, but that is if if R crashes and you're in the middle of some tests, it's worth looking into. <laughs> did your stuff actually clean up or not? Um, and then yeah, uh, I actually I found this one really interesting because I had seen R Lang is interactive, and I was like, but why why did they reproduce like? exactly basically reproduce a, an existing base function and it is because you can't fake interactive um the base interactive like it uh it's a, if you don't know interactive is a base function that basically returns true if you're calling it interactively returns false if it's being run by something else that isn't interactive um and you can't make it lie which makes testing hard. You can't like test, you can't run an automated test that thinks it's interactive. Um, but with Arlang is interactive, you can run an automated test and then set that value of whether it's interactive or not. Um, so both, if you're running it manually, you can make it think it's not interactive. And if you're running it uh, automated, you can make it think it is interactive if that's important for whatever you're trying to test. So uh, I thought that was a good, thing to realize like if you are importing our lang for any other purpose using this instead of interactive is probably a good idea just to give you the control to um to fake it <laughs> basically um and then the other thing that she points out is uh if you are running a function that is using any of this stuff like 
be careful what you're returning because the thing you return might not exist as soon as you return it. <laughs> so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, for the most part, I, I don't think I've ever ever done that, but I could see with the temp file stuff being tempted to return that. And, and like the whole point is it goes away as soon as it's done. So, so yeah, um, that is test fixtures. Go ahead. So John, I'm just going to, um, I guess on the theme of sort of um, like changing your environment for purposes of the test, I'm wondering if you happen to know of any ways in which you can affect um, things that maybe sit outside of the environment to sort of spoof them. So I'm thinking of maybe um, our, you know, your R environment file um, or um, our profile. I mean, I guess those get loaded up somehow. I'm not sure if they're elements of the environment or, or not uh, during the session. But I'm wondering if you happen to know of any any ways that you can do that. For I, I guess my question is really more motivated. Like I have some tests that run where I'm actually changing my R environment file and I'm okay with that. But maybe right. there might be a situation where I wouldn't want to, to do that. And I don't know of any way that I can sort of um, pretend that there's no R environment file and write to it and interact with it for purposes of the test. I can't think of anything like that directly. Like you can do local environment and um, local options, which are the main things that you'll be impacting with our environment and our profile. The actual file itself, um, whether like changing what happens there, you know, that's a session level, which is a little bit above environment level and rare enough that like it's a, a pretty base R kind of feeling. So um, I think you would have to like specifically test the file, like check, check the contents of the literal file. Uh, itself for that and, and like yeah. you know what happens with and without it and things something like that yeah that's um, that, that'd been my approach I basically like ingested my our environment file kind of saved it in an object and then deleted it you know from the file <laughs> system yeah. and then you know for a test I wanted to see like if our environment doesn't exist for me like I'm, I'm writing some some things into uh uh like environment variables into our environment um and uh, you know, I want to make sure that the function actually does that, um, and, and then you know, also check that the that, that the R environment file contains what it's meant to contain, stuff stuff like that. So yeah, I, I kind of done that manual step. Um, I was just wondering, you know, again, like if there's a simpler a simpler way. Like, sounds like there may not be, or if there is, you're you're not aware of it. Yeah, correct. Um, I think. You know, it, it might be worth looking at the test that tests or the use that tests for um, edit our environment and edit our profile, except they just open it. They don't actually change it. They, they tell you how to change it. And I think that's probably why that it's hard to test that kind of thing. And it's, you know, you want to make sure you're really sure <laughs> that if you're at an automatically changing our environment and our profile. Um, yeah, I don't know of any way to do that automatically. All right, so the the next related thing on this was, um, no, not that yet. Do, 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 go out of the way. Uh, the, you know, we had seen some of these, but just to to pick up the the help related to that, there's this teardown and end function that is just for uh, setting up this environment for. Um, package level uh, uh, test fixtures. So if you, if you create something and set up .r, tear it down using this teardown environment, and that means it'll get destroyed when the tests finish running. Um, like I said, if you try to run your setup.r uh, interactively, things won't work right there because that teardown environment doesn't work, but you can automatically run setup.r with uh, package load, you know, control shift L, um, so that's that. Let's see. Oh, um, there are two local functions that are exported by test that. So local test context and local reproducible output. Um, so this local test context is what I was missing uh, to make teardown work. So you want to run local test context to tell 
test that or to trick test that into thinking that you are running tests. Um, yeah, so <laughs> just that's uh, that's the idea there. I, I I don't know if it's ever a good idea to really do that. Um, but I, I guess I had cases where I, I couldn't figure th something out because I didn't know that existed basically. Um, and then legal, yeah, local reproducible output sets all these options, like a whole family of options slash, I'm not sure if it's in options or environment variables or both, but to make things behave in a standardized way. And so the times that you would want to use that specifically would be if you are specifically trying to turn off Unicode or um, not create hyperlinks in CLI output or you know whatever these different things do, um, uh, change the the lang. Uh, like I actually, I think I had some tests where I couldn't figure out why. Like I was like, what? No, that isn't. You know, this is running in this other context. Why is that not uh, failing? It's like, oh, because it makes it act as if it's not running in that context to keep a zillion other things from failing in tests. So I think it is a good thing, but it's good to know about so you can understand why um, things like might be more standardized than you think they should be, basically. Um, so yeah, that's the two local uh, outputs. Um, or not outputs, but exported functions. And then the just a little like slight side note is they just uh, added mocking back into test that it has not yet been released. Um, I don't, I don't think. Although now that I say this, I'm noting that this is three one seven, not three one seven nine thousand. So, um, is that I guess it did make it to Cran. Um, so yes, it is in the brand new, um, it's probably here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so they have officially released the mocking. So it is on CRAN um, and it it is, you know, very familiar looking with mocked bindings and local mocked bindings. It's built on a Wither framework. And um, the idea is like, you can redefine functions in the context of a given test. And so you could say that in um, in this test, pretend that like my the one that's always on my head or in my head is whenever you call the function that actually hits the API, instead use this other function that doesn't hit the API. It does this fake thing. And so any like any functions that you're calling within that test, if they call that function, they will use your fake your mocked version. And um, so if you have a function that actually connects to your database, instead of actually connecting to your database, connect to this file or whatever, do a, a fake thing in the context of the test. I haven't used this yet. I expect I will use it a lot. Um, but yeah, it's that's the general idea. Um, the, the way they wrote it is, it, so it used to be, I don't know, like the old way of doing mocks was complicated and confusing. And here the idea is the dots are like function definitions. And so you just say, you know, new fun or other function equals, and then you just define the function. Um, I don't, they don't have examples in the help for this yet. And I think they really, really need to, to make sure that I'm not hundred percent sure I understand how it works. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the idea here. And then again, it would set those things up. And then when the environment exits, it will go back to using the normal versions of those functions. Um, they do like something I really like is that it's possible to mock functions from other packages. They like have lots of warnings around that. Uh, but there are times, especially like I said, within that Slack verse that we work on, there's one central package that does like the actual calls to Slack. And then there are wrapper packages that use that central package to implement um, specific pieces of interacting with Slack. So posting messages versus just getting counts or getting threads or things like that. 
Um, and so you might want to mock, or we probably will want to mock that central packages functions within the tests of the other packages so that when they try to call the central package actual hit the API thing, they'll just call the um, HTTP test function that hits the, uh, or that loads everything from a file. So I don't know, I haven't used this yet. I have things that I uh, wrote just actually like the day that Hadley made this pull request, I was doing this stuff and I was like, come on, you're changing the way it works just as I come to understand how how the other way works. But it looks like it's gonna be really useful. So um, that's that. Let's see. Uh, oh, and then, yeah, that was pulling up the mocks. Um, we did these. Oh, custom, yeah, let me come back to that in a sec. We talked about that, talked about those, so, okay. So um, before I move on, that's, uh, that is fixtures. Are there any questions, comments, concerns? Um, the other piece for today was I just wanted to give a really brief uh, look at like the existence of um, Withers. You know, it has a nice reference and within the context that we just talked about, all these locals are what you would want to use. So. If you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I mock a database connection? Well, okay, there's local DB connection. So go read that help would be the idea. Of, or how do I, I mean, not mock, but like work with uh, uh, temporary versions of. Um, if you want to change the way that files are uh, viewed or saved or whatnot, that's all this local stuff or a local, you know, file uh, image stuff. Uh, there's local files, there's local environment variables. Uh, you can change the language, you can change where, what libraries things can see. So there are all these things that are within the Wither package. We may go through this package in more detail in the future, but um, it has lots of examples um, of the kinds of things you might want to change. Uh, like uh, what version of the random number generator is being used because there are different versions what the seed is, so local seed, and you'll go back to unsetting it basically when you're done. Um, uh, sync is um, a whole other thing that's like dangerous to work with because you can change the way our like outputs things. And so I like that they have a local uh, sync setting that it'll change. Um, you know, output to, instead of going to the console, it goes to a temp file, I mean, a log file, something like that would be the, the idea there. Um, and of course, local time zone because time zones are awful and evil. And so uh, it's good that they have, I, I'm actually probably gonna have to use that to uh, do some tests, build some tests into the book club app. So, and <laughs> good timing uh, for Priyanka to come on for local time zone. Uh, it's a very potentially useful function for seeing <laughs> uh, how things work in other people's time zones. All right. Um, so the last piece of test that that we haven't gone over, I have not like gone into this uh, in detail, but we can kind of at least kind of read it together. Um, is custom expectations. Now, I think th like the caveat on this is be really sure before bothering to create your own custom expectation. Like if it's close enough to, you know, expect length, but, oh, but I have a special rule around how I want to expect length. Most of the time you probably just want to use expect length, you know, or use other built-in expectations. And let me pull those up while I'm trying to talk about that. Um, that, you know, they have, uh, all of those built-in expectations. Um, make sure you understand what is there before you even think about building your own. But they do have ways to build to um, create your own that will work the same general way as expect as other expect functions. Uh, I could see like probably if you are creating your own. Um, S3 class, 
building your own expectation for that S S3 class is probably a good idea. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know of any other thing, but <laughs> that's so that's the general idea. Um, let's see. And then, uh, so yeah, let's look at expect length. So it, it takes an object and the expected length. Um, they have this quasi label function. So I guess actually that's going to be, uh, it's probably not even in here actually. Yeah. Yes. So uh, quasi label is one that's like it's in test that and it's, it's exported, but it's not in the main help reference because you only need it in the context of making custom expectations. Um, and so they talk about that it is like making the object, it's it's capturing the object um, without yet evaluating the object. So that's what's going on there. Um, and then you're checking some, um, uh, so that's this act is creating this labeled object. And you can see that one of the things that's in there is a value. So just say, yeah, it returns the evaluated value and the label generated from it. So the, um, like the name, what what was it? It's actually kind of useful to know about. So, um, so yeah, you check the value for the actual expectation and then you use the built-in or the test that core expect function, which is like the long form version of an expectation. And then, um, you know, build up your error message. It, it would be interesting to see if they're changing these to use uh, CLI or if they're still working with sprint death. Um, I'm curious actually, uh, let's see if I can, um, I wanna see if how much this code matches the actual current code. Uh, it is, okay. It's, um, here, let me throw this into the chat. That's the actual code for uh, expect length. So the things that it's not showing in this vignette is there's a stop if not, should just do some basic testing of is this a thing that's worth thinking about? Uh, the argument here actually is the argument, does the argument make sense? Um, and then it does do the quasi label and it does the testing here and it does use sprintf for the error message, sprintf, whatever. Um, and then it returns the value. So um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I knew that it outputs the value when you do expectations, but that's interesting to see. So it does, like an expectation can be used as a pass through that doesn't change the object. You know, like you could use it in a pipe without it changing anything. That's interesting. Um, it's actually really interesting, just a side thought of, you could throw test that tests or expectations like into a pipeline to check your pipeline to make sure it's making sense. Um, I wonder if that's what a cert R does. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but it seems like that's something that kind of checks expectations about the data in a pipeline and stops if those expectations aren't met. Yeah, I, I've looked into this a little bit. Um, I know like these are the expect family is not built to be super, super efficient. So I wouldn't use it in like within function checks, like value argument checks, but for, huh, I, I don't know. It's really, it's an intriguing idea to me to put it into um, like, I don't know, a targets pipeline or something, or, or just a normal script pipeline of, is this thing what I expect that it is before going on to the next step? Um, I don't know. I uh, haven't thought about that at all because I hadn't uh, thought of that just now, but uh, it might be an interesting use case for test that. Um, and then, so yeah, it does this quasi labeling. It uh, checks the actual expectation using expect. Um, 
first argument of expect is uh, what you know what happens a thing that returns true or false. So it's some argument that returns true or false. In this case, it's the n value is equal to the n that came in. So they we defined act n is the length, and then make sure that it's that length. And if not, um, this is where this quasi label is useful because this act lab that is returned by quasi label is like the name of the actual object. So whatever name it came in with, if it was X, it would say X has length, whatever the length is, not the expected length. Um, if you haven't worked with uh, a sprint def, it has like some simple, nice formatting of things to print. So percent S means it's a string, percent I means it's an integer. And I think there are some, there are date things and what, you know, different things that will do some standard um, formatting. So that's here. Okay, this is a string or a character. This should be an integer and this should be an integer. That's all that's doing there. And then it invisibly returns the value. Um, let's see. And then, okay, and then they say to use succeed and fail if it's like hard <laughs> to do something else. Um, and so, yeah, that would be where you say that you need succeed and or fail, like that is being generated, that is um, the wrappers around uh, the the expect and succeed will pass the like the check mark through to the test. So the test knows that, okay, this did pass and then it returned the value. Versus if it fails, you want it to re uh, send the fail out to test that and return the message. And that's it. That's all of test that. Any thoughts, comments, questions? I didn't mean to end, you know, exactly or as soon as Priyanka got on, but uh, that is the whole package. So we talked a little bit at the beginning that um, we'll talk on Slack, but we're probably going to continue with Shiny Test 2, even though Shiny Test 2 is a very like specific use case. It has it seems to have a lot of philosophy of testing in the articles. And I think that's something that can be useful regardless of what you're actually testing. Um, and it has like it's mostly testing, not so much. I mean, sorry, mostly articles, not that much on actual like individual function uh, documentation. And I think that could be an interesting one to go through. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about that on Slack. Uh, if anyone has any other comments, uh, go, you know, let us know. But if not, all right, I will see you all on Slack. Oh, go ahead. It looks like Rebecca Thank might be saying something. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm glad we made it through. Test that is a very useful package and it's good to have like dove into some of the weeds with it. All right. Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.